All right. So to start off with, good morning, everyone. We're actually uh, in Australia. I'm in Sydney. Nick's in Canberra. So it's a very early start for us. So if we uh, if we stumble a little, um, uh, excuse that, and I'm sure that'll be no problem. But uh, um, let's let's get straight into it because, as you know, some of the installations that we've been looking at uh, today have taken some time, and ours is no exception. So I'm going to quickly introduce the architecture, and then we're going to jump into getting the installer kicked off and start to see the good stuff. Um, so to put open, uh, I'll, I, I come to the uh, OKD space from OpenShift. Um, I, I work for Red Hat, so I will probably just you know, uh, mix the terms up. But yeah, so to put OKD on OpenStack, we have to look at some key integration points. Um, but in the middle of all of that is the use of the OpenStack APIs. We don't ever want to interact with our underlying infrastructure without going through those APIs so that we can ensure a good sense of um, control over the environment. So when we do this installation, we're going to utilize some different aspects, which we'll dive into a bit later once we have it running um, and questions come up and such. But we're going to use, utilize different components of the open stack environment, things such as um, Glance for um, image storage. Uh, we're going to use some Cinder for block uh, and disk storage or uh, presentation. And we're going to also use um, object storage, uh, a bit of everything. And of course, during the talk, I mean, um, Nick will will break in with his insights and, and please say any, you know, please add anything um, based on the experiences we've all had. Um, so we um, we're going to we're going to try to implement essentially what's sitting uh, here uh, to to demonstrate how open uh, shift or OKD can actually sit on top of OpenStack. Um, in this example, you can see I'm setting up an, uh, an OpenStack via an overcloud. So we're going to be using Red Hat OpenStack platform, but it'll work the same with most OpenStacks. So as you would have known and, and heard a bit today, there are many different ways or multiple different ways to install OKD. There's the full, full uh, I should say, full automation, which is the installer provision infrastructure model. Um, this is a guided install. It's easy, but um, very prescriptive. And we're going to use that today so that we can just dig right into the way OpenStack handles OpenShift. Um, there is, of course, a UPI model, and that's fully supported as well on top of OpenStack. Um, so this is where we use pre-existing infrastructure. It's flexible and uh, can be more complicated, but we do supply plenty of helper scripts. The community is writing them. There's lots of really cool stuff going on. Um, we don't require OpenStack admin privileges for either of these installs. So to really reinforce that today, I'm not, I did not install this OpenStack cloud. I'm using an internal cloud. I do not have admin privileges on the cloud. I just wanted to, to see what it was like as an actual um, installer. So let's go straight to the install because, again, it's going to take a bit of time and we'll see how far we get. I have two environments. I've got one I prepared already, and hopefully we can use that to show a simple demo of something. But we're going to install on this current environment called Mechulin. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. So as mentioned, hopefully this is large enough. We have a running OpenStack cloud, right? So nothing too exciting. Uh, it's got Cinder for volume. It's got a basic uh, setup where we have an external network uh, presenting our uh, external connectivity. I've gone ahead and created a, basic, a simple um, tenant network because what I want to do is show that we can actually plumb into that network with uh, some of our OpenStack nodes or OpenShift nodes. What else have we got sitting in here? Um, got some object storage, so we're looking at a bit of um, Swift. Uh, in this case, we are backed by a Ceph install, and so this is going through Rados Gateway or RGW just to, to ac access that. Um, what else? A couple of floating IPs that need to be pre-allocated and set up in DNS. But to really understand how that works, let me switch back to the um, <clears throat> installation window. And how we talk to the cloud for, for the installer is to the usual clouds.yaml uh, file. And in, in this case, I've got two clouds uh, indicated here. I'm going to be using the one I've called OpenStack with my demo user. And what we'll see in the minute is when we run the OpenShift installer, it's actually just going to communicate with the cloud directly and prompt me for various aspects of, of what is needed in that cloud. That's how we can then in, in create our install config file. Now, while it's an IPI and it will generate most of that on its own, um, 
we will add some extra pieces to it. So let's get right to building the install. So we're going to do a create install dash config. We're going to do this off, as I mentioned, a specific um, cloud. First thing it asks me for is a public key. Again, this will seed inside of the ignition file to allow us to SSH to the CoreOS or Fedora CoreOS nodes. Um, additionally, you've seen that. So now it's actually reading the Cloud's YAML file and it's asking me which cloud I want to install on. And I'm going to choose OpenStack. It asks me what my external network is. Um, you can see that right now, seeing the same stuff I just showed you in the other install, that we've got um, a custom tenant network and an external. So this will be my external network. I need to have two IPs set up previous to the installation. Um, one is for the API VIP, which we'll see how it sits in front of the tenant networks that get created. This one, I've preset it up in DNS and Route 53 just to make it easy. The other IP that's required is for the Ingress router. Uh, same situation, it's the wildcard domain for apps. It's also been set up inside of, um, inside of, uh, in Route 53. So we'll select that. <clears throat> uh, gotta choose a flavor. Um, these are being presented to me as a tenant in the cloud, so this one looks good. Um, the usual stuff here, I've got a base domain prepped. I'll call it that. And then the pulse secret is the same thing that um, uh, we saw before. It's the, the fake one. And that'll generate my cloud config. But I've actually, so I actually have to make some alterations to that. And um, what I, what I want to do is I actually, I have it here. I have one ready and then the one we just created. So a couple of things that we're going to do to make this IPI install a little, little bit more customized is um, as you'll see on the on the left in the red, I have reduced the number of replicas down to one. Um, in theory, I'm hoping to speed up the installation time. In practice, I may not be. Um, additionally, I'm able to add that additional network IP. This block actually belongs to the worker nodes, not to the controllers. So um, that network you saw on there, I'll be able to go ahead and attach um, automatically with the installer. Um, additionally, for the um, uh, the control plane nodes. I'm going to add a root volume and uh, an ephemeral vol or sorry, a block volume out of Cinder. Um, this is the volume pool provided by OpenStack um, that I can I can actually carve um, volumes out of. Uh, again, and I'm doing this mostly to to just demonstrate the features. We might use that because we need to back etcd with something fast. Uh, we might prefer to install this way just to have the options. Um, and then uh, what else? I've added an external DNS. So when the OpenShift installer creates the subnet, it can seed it with a name server. It doesn't have to. Many clouds may offer that um, directly, um, but it's a, a, a convenient way. And yeah, Nick, if you've got anything to add, I absolutely hope you jump in. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say the um, with the volumes, um, having centralized storage like that allows you to to do, you know, VM migration much more easily and everything between um, computes on OpenStack. Yeah. Um, so in, additionally, I'm specifying the cluster OS image. Those who have done uh, bare metal installs are probably familiar with this. I'm doing this because while the IPI installer does, uh, as you saw the guys do in the previous install, it does pull down a QCOW. Um, it, it, the problem is because I'm backed by Ceph, I want to use a raw image. So I'm able to create my own, place it in there, and still access it from the UPI, uh, the IPI installer. So again, interest of time, I'm going to create, create that or add that config file into my uh, directory so that now I'm actually installing off of that one. All right, so again, the pieces I just spoke about, <clears throat> as the guys mentioned, we're using OVN, Kubernetes on there. Uh, you might have seen that in the previous. That's done in uh, OKD, but in OpenShift, it's tech preview at the moment. Um, so anyway, let's get the install going. We're going to watch the environment as we do this. So I've set up a watch that's going to show various components uh, as the instances are built, images are, are used, that type of thing. Let's get this going. Um, we're going to do the same, create cluster off our directory and I'm like previous guys I like debug okay so this should go ahead and get that install 
going. Right, so it's loading off of uh, clouds.yaml, and very quickly we will be able to, as the install grows, we will, we will be able to see the uh, infrastructure begin to appear in OpenStack. Yeah, I was going to say one of the reasons you might want to attach multiple networks is if you want to implement something like Maltus later and attach pods to uh, multiple networks to give um, pods access to, you know, direct access to uh, to the outside world. Mm. Yeah, Nick's playing with some really uh, exciting stuff where we can start putting um, OpenShift into telco environments. Um, so it's really cool. Uh, as you can see, the, the build has begun, so the installation has started. Um, and the one point we notice is the ignition file has been created. Um, in an IPI install, this is stored automatically in Glance. In UPI, you can store it wherever you want. Um, but for an IPI, we get it for free in Glance. Um, additionally, the volumes have started to be built for the control plane and bootstrap nodes. Now, as you know, we didn't actually specify anything for the bootstrap, but because it's part of that initial cluster uh, to do the, the bootstrapping, um, it defaults to using the same as the control plane installation. Um, what else can we say about this? The, the ports, the master um, ports are, are being created um, and allocated um, against that internal tenant network that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Um... The actual DHCP control of that machine network, the 10.0016, is actually handled by the OpenStack router as well. Right. And, um, let's see what else. So the floating IPs have now been matched to an internal to the internal network. Um, I believe they're all trunks that are are created for each of the instances as mm -hmm. well. And in a telco world where you may want to have a, um, a jumbo MTU or something on the system, um, you would set that all up through your OpenStack um, Neutron, setting the the default MTU to a certain size that it, that it when it creates networks, and the router will sorry the DHCP server the OpenStack DHCP server will tell the um, uh, the OK DVMs as well, but the MTU is, and they'll set it accordingly. So they'll come up with a, a jumbo frame as well for the MTU on the on the node network. All right. Now, what you'll notice is done here in an open shift on stack install. A couple of other things have appeared. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is we have another floating IP that's appeared. This is actually chosen at random. It's not preset, and it's attached to the bootstrap node to allow us to jump on there and, I guess, troubleshoot, look around, um, and see what's going on. And that same, um, that same, what's it called, uh, SSH key was added to that node. And so, in theory, uh, once that thing comes up, we can connect to it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the bootstrap. Perfect. So the bootstrap is is actually on its way up, and hopefully we can get onto it. You might want to show the console. Of there we go. Controller. Let's um, yeah, continually trying to get the um, uh, the ignition file cool. from the bootstrap, and when it's ready, it will get it and, and boot itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I can probably get this out of the way. We can see what OpenStack has done. Um, and we can see what's being built up. And as Nick said, the controllers, there we go. So this is this two-phase installation. Um, the first phase is completed on the bootstrap, so soon it will be able to give this controller its access. And so now we should have cry control and all that on there.
pray. Now it's just a case of waiting for the installation to um, begin. And we can as well, um, I'll just jump off again. And we, I've set this up so um, slowly we should start to get some life out of things. Bit too early, I think. Yeah. So probably the more exciting thing to watch here is, is the journal. And, it, and it's downloading the um, images live, so depending on your internet speed, it could take a little while. <laughs> yeah, but we can see it coming up. You can see it's all beginning to start up. Perfect. Eventually that cluster, I mean, this is the same install process. Hopefully you've been watching all day, but you've been seeing all day um, to actually to get us there. there. So as Nick was pointing out, the um, images have just been grabbed by the controllers. And now we should be able to start to see the cluster form. Uh -huh. And there's our first piece. Now with that, <clears throat> with the installation, if you notice, there's no floating IP placed on any of the control plane nodes. And ideally, right, you're not going to jump onto them. Um, but we can actually just jump over to them if we want um, by just using a jump command for Linux for SSH. And then we can watch what the, cluster, what the masters are doing. They're given the same key. Oh, you and can so the same process is going to be happening. Sorry? You can do it the lazy way, like me, and assign a, another floating IP address to them via the uh, horizon. Yeah. Do we? yeah. So as you can see, we don't have any of the tools, so we haven't gone through the, the phase, the first phase yet. Um, but you'll see it's happening there. There we go. In a minute, it'll kick us off. And what you're seeing is the same installation process across um, that you've seen across all the other platforms. Um, except we're sitting here in, inside of uh, inside of Open uh, OpenStack. Um, what else can we add? Is it's not the most thrilling. I have more slides. There we go. Um, so we're switching over to the um, the uh, into the second phase in a minute. We'll get kicked off, and then the cluster will go ahead and build up. And once that's come on, I want to jump back on the machine and have a look at some of the networking aspects that are being mm -hmm. set up on there. Yeah. There we go. Uh, as you can see, um, the installer has also set up all our security groups for the cluster. Um, and again, they're all unique to this to this one um, cluster. So, as a tenant in OpenStack, I could run I could run multiple uh, clusters uh, in the same space. Just have to have mm -hmm. your quota set up. Things have to work. If I didn't have Swift, um, it would place the um, the, the registry back into um, uh, into block storage into Cinder, um, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. I just really did want to get the the installer running for the hope of actually hitting that final line. So if we now go back to the masters, and one thing to note is um, the reason you can have multiple clusters as a tenant is that it tags every um, every resource that it deploys for the specific cluster. It tags it with the cluster ID. So if you were to go and uh, on OpenStack, 
and do a show on a, on a network that it created, you'll see that it's tagged with a unique cluster ID. Um, so when you, it comes to tearing it down, it doesn't go and tear down every every um, resource you've got deployed on OpenStack. My uh, blue jeans is hurting my machine. So here's what Nick's. Hopefully, I'm still with you guys. Yeah. Uh, here's what Nick's talking about. <clears throat> we got the tag. We got the um, unique network set up there. But if you uh, click on the um, actual name, August. Yep. Yeah. Of the network. Um, well, it doesn't show you the tags on the GUI. If you were to do a, a show, OpenStack show network on uh, on the CLI and OpenStack, you will see actually a tags uh, property as well. On this guy. Yeah, if you do a, a show on the, um, yep, on that guy. You'll see the tags down these, yep, down there, where it marks them specific to this um, cluster ID, and it does it to the VMs and everything as well. Cool. If we hop over to back onto our control plane before we actually, before the master disappears, or the bootstrap disappears. Um, again, I, I before I ran the... Uh, Control. You can see some of the functions and stuff we have. So core DNS is running, and this is handling all the internal uh, name server stuff for the cloud, uh, for the for the cluster, where we are getting like you can see the settings that were were created when we did the installer, um, and I was able to uh, set the forwarder to, to set that, and then. We can see how our internal network has got a set of, of VIPs um, created, and these are going to be balanced across the entire cluster. Um, so this is all handled internally with the IPI install. Obviously, with the UPI, you can you can do different things if you need to, but as a great way to get OKD running very fast on OpenStack, not having to um, fiddle around with too much external networking and DNS and such. Um, th this is quite convenient, and this is managed, and again, all by Keep Alive D. So we can we it sets up the um, the the VRRP st um, communication, and then and again Nick Nick's the networking expert here, so he'll correct me when I say mm -hmm. the wrong things. But we set up various different VIPs inside. Uh, this is for the API. We set up a DNS VIP so that all the internal nodes can resolve against it. Yeah. As well as the ingress, which we'll go and set up in a minute. Now, if um, you know, if if your OpenStack is in within a uh, private network, so um, and these IP addresses clash with that private network, you, you can renumber them uh, through the install config file. Right. Two, but also. Because we're going to lose the bootstrap soon. Uh, HA proxy is running there as well. Again, this is all set up by the IPI installer, um, and we get we get it all all for free. And then shortly, what Nick was talking about there is in that install config. You can actually. Be very specific, and I know you've run into issues where that does happen, right? Where the cider yep. is being used elsewhere, especially or... in, if you're installing it on um, OpenStack that's inside a enterprise network. It's typically will be using ten addresses itself. You might want to uh, change it to one seventy two sixteen or or mm -hmm. some some other you know private addressings. Yeah. Now, one other piece of uh, setup that we need to do manually that hasn't that will be I think it's being added to the the next uh, release of, of the various pieces is to 
attached, we, ha we still have that extra floating IP. And we want to go ahead and attach that to the um, the ingress port, so that um, the the app you know the app URL and, and all the apps can resolve. So at the moment we do that manually uh, with a, just an open set command. So this is a floating IP. I'm going to set the port to use the floating IP we designated and set up in DNS. So right, if we look at anything .apps .my cluster and name, um, we're going to actually get that resolution against that IP. So now is where we get to sort of <laughs> the kind of the boring part of the install. Everything is is rolling, um, but what's going to happen in a minute, as everyone knows, is we're going to have that bootstrap uh, term. Ah, oh, there it goes actually. So that's nice timing. So the bootstrap is currently being um, removed, and the that means the cluster is actually self-sufficient. Get him. Great sign. So we've got our three masters up and ready, and we are now moving into that second part of actually getting the cluster and the operators to go. Actually moving along quite nicely. Um, and then finally, everyone's favorite. We can see that the um, the various operators are starting to come up. So, what I thought we might do while this is running, uh, in is quickly look at some of as as. <laughs> Well, he was saying the last one uh, was the stuff about the slides. I've got a couple of slides, so let's let's briefly talk about those things. Um, before we go, um, the timing here is actually accelerating, and I love it. Uh, what we have going on here is uh, the bootstrap's been removed. We have our, our uh, control plane now established. You'll notice that the image for ignition has been removed as well. That's wonderful because obviously there's sensitive stuff in there and we don't want to have that sitting around. So the installer removes that. Obviously, if you're using another method, you need to do that yourself um, or expire it or protect it or whatever you need to do. But the installer is looking after that. Um, we are still, as you remember, we asked, I, I think I have got one mass, uh, one uh, worker coming up and we're going to connect it to the this extra network, <clears throat> but we haven't seen that actually happen yet until the workers come up. So let's quickly, I want to quickly go back to these slides because I think that it helps to visualize a bit of what's going on while it's happening in the background. So essentially this is the, <clears throat> the IPI deployment flow on, on uh, OpenStack. Um, it's similar, obviously, to other um, other cloud providers, but I found it helpful just to, to outline it, right? We run the installer, um, and then this bootstrap node grabs our Fedora core OS or our Red Hat core OS image at a glance. Uh, it grabs uh, ignition from glance um, and then sets up the bootstrap cluster. And then that cluster can pull the containers and then maintain itself as normal. Um, these are all running through Nova, um, and they can be backed by Cinder, whatever, we'll talk more. Um, once that bootstrap cluster is established um, and we we wait the Keep Alive D back over to the three master nodes, and the cluster is established. And then we are able to go ahead and add workers through a machine set, which is what the installer will actually build for you. So let's dive quickly into the integrations um, as the installer goes in the background. Um, we visited this already. You should be familiar with what's happening there. So where are the integration points for OpenStack when you're putting OKD on there? One is the image service. Um, so this is Glance, where we will store a core OS image for the base install um, and the ignition payload. We can't um, add it to directly to Cloud Init because Cloud Init can't, it's too big. So um, what we actually do is offer the uh, instance uh, just a URL to go retrieve it. It does mean that the core OS image and that, that tenant will need access to Glance. Um, the next thing to talk about is networking. Um, so to try to summarize what we saw happening there, and, and please, you know, Nick, add when you have more here, we stick OpenStack floating IPs in front of these internal VIPs, that, and they're all managed by KeepAliveD to balance across the cluster. Uh, 
There's an API VIP on the bootstrap, bootstrap till the cluster is up, shouldn't be unfamiliar, which is then weighted back to the masters. Those FIPs, as we talked about, have to be established uh, in DNS prior to installation. The masters will then run everything that's needed for the cluster, your DHCP, an HA proxy, Core DNS, the plugin for Core DNS, the MDNS publisher, and keep alive D. Uh, the ingress VIP is then set to the workers um, and not fronted by, oh, and fronted by a floating IP, which in our case we have to manually assign. The machine network is the neutron tenant network that was built. This is what Nick was talking about, how you can actually change it to a different CIDR if you need to, or a different uh, network ID if you need to. Um, but that is managed by the installer on an IPI. Um, you can uh, you, you can customize that somewhat by what Nick said. Um, it, yeah. Let's see. There's, yeah. there's a tenant. There's a tenant on OpenStack. I mean, you can use the same IP addressing um, across multiple clusters on, on OpenStack, and and what distinguishes them is the NATed address or the floating IP address that you assign to them. So each cluster that you deploy in OpenStack as a tenant would have different floating IP. Would need its unique floating IPs and DNS names registered. Mm. But in terms of the internal IP addressing, they could be the same. Are you? Are we seeing a lot of people doing like one cluster per cloud, or when? When is that? When are you? What are you seeing out there? Um, in enterprises, I mean, you know, in enterprises, I, I see more uh, multiple clusters. You know, a dev cluster, a pre-prod cluster, a um, production cluster, say on OpenStack. Or you may even go down to specific development teams. So you know, a development team may want their own cluster, and you can easily, um, as their own tenant on OpenStack, you can easily spin up their own cluster on that. Um, another aspect of networking which we didn't talk about here is um, this is running the open uh, the OKD SDN on top of the OpenStack SDN. So we've got, in a way, we've got double encapsulation uh, with VXLAN. Uh, and, but with OpenStack, you've got the option of deploying um, Courier, which allows uh, Kubernetes to interact directly with the um, OpenStack SDN itself. Um, so it creates, it, it removes the the um, the OKD encapsulation layer, and uh, it creates um, the infrastructure networks that it requires. For OKD creates a, creates them natively on on OpenStack itself, and in that mm -hmm. type of deployment, if you were to enable uh, Courier, uh, there will be many many more uh, networks that you'll see created on OpenStack, and not just the main um, node network, which is then it encapsulates um, then it uses its own SDN to encapsulate all the uh, infrastructure networks across. Uh, so at the moment, that's being abstracted to us, uh, and all the OKD infrastructure networks are being encapsulated across this orange network that you're seeing here on OpenStack. But if you were to integrate the um, OKD and OpenStack SDNs through Courier, you'll see multiple networks being created here, uh, one for each infrastructure network and one for each um, namespace or pro uh, or a project in um, in OKD as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't play with Courier on this one, and and some of that was because the version of of OpenStack I'm using um, doesn't actually have um, it uses OVS and can be a bit heavy, and my resources are limited. I wasn't yeah, able to yeah. do it. So this is quite good. The uh, worker node has actually come up, so we're progressing quite well with the installation. Um, as you can see through my watch command, we've connected to both networks, so we're my BYON OKD network as well as the OpenShift network that was created by the installer. Um, additionally, we now have containers created. Uh, not those containers, they're different kind of containers. These are um, object storage, and this is going to be the backing for the internal registry. Now, it bothered me a lot that there were um, multiple names here, so I asked the developers, and it's a bug. So there, there's only meant to be one, and they're they're working through that. Um, not sure how that happened, but these containers will will be created. Um, if we had been using uh, Cinder 
for our registry, we would see another volume attached to one of the workers. Um, obviously, that's not a best practice for HA, uh, whereas for an object store, it's not pinned to an instance. So, so far, the installation is, is quite, quite good at the moment. Um, all the components are coming up. And as you saw in here, um, we've actually yeah, attached into that network. So let's see the status of the install. All right, the worker's up. Might even be able to do a scale on here. Oops. And one thing that you know you can see that what is all set up for you. Um, if we um, yep, the installation seems to be moving along pretty nicely. Uh, this should complete shortly, uh, so let's quickly jump back to the the slides to finish what we were talking about. Uh, uh, someone I work with at Red Hat, Robert Heinzman, a colleague of mine, did this incredible drawing to try to capture what's going on with all the different um, components of the um, of the installation. And so I wanted to reproduce it here. It's it's all his, but I, it really helped me to understand how it holds together. You can see where we have our floating IPs sitting in front of our uh, tenant-based VIPs, where the balance is with Keep Alive D, um, and and how the whole thing is held together. Um, again, so just to talk through these integration points, we have got, um, in one case, I showed an example of where we set a root volume. Um, I set it to 30 in the actual demo, but we saw those connected. And as I mentioned, it can be regist the registry backend, um, but that's not the preferred method. Uh, IPI, the installer, will actually test to see if it has access to object storage. If it doesn't or, or get some kind of like no access errors or whatever, it will go ahead and set it up in Cinder. Uh, something that's coming soon uh, and something that's near and dear to Nick, I think, these days is uh, the addition of more storage support for o OKD and, and OpenShift. Um, right now, we are a little bit limited in that there's no um, RWX support under the, by using Cinder for uh, volumes. Of course, you can use an NFS server. You can set up a storage class. But um, Manila is is um, being brought in, um, and that is what brought a lot of the BYON functionality. Nick, if you want to add anything about Manila or yeah, just, um, yeah. Well, I mean, what Manila will give um, OpenShift is the ability to basically utilize um, NFS on, you know, typically a Ceph uh, storage cluster that's deployed with OpenStack. Um, and the way OpenStack does it, or I should say Ceph does it for uh, to present an NFS front end to OpenStack resources is it uses the um, Ganesha project, which does uh, NFS to Ceph FS gateway for you. And Manila's responsibility is to establish and secure the uh, the file shares. So what that would allow you to do is then is to create um, Persistent volumes um, that can be shared across um, multiple uh, or well, pods running on multiple uh, workers, because they'll all be able to, uh, you know, use uh, yeah, standard NFS mounting to communicate. And I think the, the Manila support is certainly uh, improving, um, but you know any up any any work that people are interested in doing to assist with this, it's a, it's a large piece of work and takes a good deal of testing and environments yeah. to back it up. Yeah. Um, some other interest, I mean, obvious stuff here is Nova for all our compute. Um, it can be ephemeral, it can be block, um, the usual. Um, requirements here that we need fast disk. Um, this isn't a public cloud, so you need to be working with an OpenStack admin to understand what kind of storage is being supported underneath that. Um, also, there's in 
improve support for availability zones so you can actually start to place the workers uh, where you want them inside the cloud. Mm. That's evolving as well around um, between the Cinder support and and Nova uh, to get that right. I know, Nick, you've had some battles with that. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, and one thing to note is and with the deployer will request um, affinity or anti-affinity for the masters and things like that. So it will, tr it will ask OpenStack to try and place them on different uh, compute nodes. So mm -hmm. it avoids trying to put, you know, two masters or three masters on the same compute node. Because obviously then you're not really running HA for your three uh, masters are running on the same physical machine that may die. But if you're only running with a small uh, OpenStack cluster with only two or three compute nodes, then you may see multiple uh, masters on the same compute. But it, it, will, then, uh, it will try you know, to spread them across different uh, physical machines. And then, yeah, and in theory, then you should be able to get away with something like a live migration, some of the built-in capabilities of the OpenStack platform. I don't know if that's 100% perfect, though. I'm sure that has its ups yeah. and downs. Yeah, I mean, I've played with it quite a bit. If you do have mm. central storage like Ceph, uh, RBD, and, um, and, you, and you do boot the, you do create it using um, volumes or ephemeral backed by, um, by Ceph on OpenStack, and that's where you start needing to really coordinate with your OpenStack administrators on how they deploy things and what's available. Uh, but uh, live migration certainly does work, even on masters. I've, I've done it many times. Um, as long as your your storage backend systems can handle it, um, you can move a, a you know a master from one physical compute to another. Yeah, and I suppose that's the, the nice thing about being able to get things like OKD straight onto an OpenStack platform is you get all that on-premise benefit of of infrastructure as a service. Well, exactly. It's a, I mean, OpenStack is a private cloud. Yes, indeed. All right, so our install is still progressing. Um, uh, the final piece that as far as the integration point is the object storage or Swift. It's the preferred register uh, registry backend for HI, HA uh, and in the default choice of the IPI installer. And we saw that. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is actually show a scaling demo. So what I've done is um, when, when the IPI installer runs, it creates just a, a machine set for the workers to make scaling simple. Uh, I'd like to demonstrate that it works and see how it works across OpenShift and OpenStack. If the cluster hasn't finished, um, I've got another one that I pre-built to just show the demo while we do it. So let's see where we are. We're not quite there with the final installation. So we're going to go ahead and bring up this second one. Hopefully we'll be successful there. Okay, so this is a different OKD install, but on a different OpenStack. Um, make sure we're all logged in. And guys, if, and it takes once, a, if, it, if it takes a little bit longer, don't worry. We'll we'll just be, you're the last talk, so you can you can go a little bit longer. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, we can keep an eye on that. But as always, that goes. So here we have um, a, an open another OpenStack environment, um, and this one has got a, an OKD install with. A number of workers. In this case, we have two workers and our three control plane nodes. Um, you can see I built this previously. Uh, the actual control plane was built days ago, and then I've scaled a few times. And this is an IPI install. It creates a default machine set for the workers, as you'd expect, which means that it's because it's using the OpenStack cloud provider, we can actually easily scale out. So why don't we add a couple of workers? And now we can simply sit back. And hopefully the two platforms are speaking to each other. Uh, in the meantime, I'm looking at the console and your other stack has completed deploying. 
Oh, excellent. We can we can we can do even more machine builds. So what we have happening here, right, is you can easily see that once we we scaled out the machine set, um, OpenShift has related that information back down to OpenStack or OKD back down to OpenStack, and we we got a matching of naming um, so that you can really see how integrated the two platforms are. And I, I know it's not surprising for those on, on AWS and such. It's like how it works every day. But in an OpenStack space, it's really helpful that we can see this same type of integration that, that's happening in all the other platforms so simply done. Um, and what I'll show you, as Nick said, because we finished the other install, that you know, this, this is what comes right out of the box. So literally, we now have machine, the machines provisioning. There may not be nodes yet because they're still building up. Um, we can see that the, uh, the um, extra, the, the new workers are being added to the topology and, and just being automatically plumbed into the right networks. If we do this on the other machine, on the other one, we'll actually get the um, um, uh, extra networks. Uh, we can see that we have the ability to um, create the, the auto scaler, the, so the custom stuff where if we want to go ahead and hit it with load, it will automatically auto scale. And that constant communication and, and interaction and integration between uh, OKD and OpenStack means um, that the two the two pieces work almost you know seamlessly, right? You, you're able to just um, to scale out without much effort. So Nick's yeah, the, told us. Big, so anyway, I the think the big that's positive pretty, of this yeah. it's you know it's running on premise, where yeah. you know open stuff would normally be running. Um, it's not in the cloud. It's not across you know depending on uh, the type of uh, workloads you're you're dealing with and security require government regulations and things like that. Yeah, I mean um, it's awesome, right? It's an an open source on premise running an open source container platform. Correct. Perfectly integrated and you know almost. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. So Nick, you're saying the other one finished? Yep. We'll put those away. That's cool. Oh so yeah, look at that. So I know Diane loves this. So here we go. We've had a successful installation on our um, on our uh, cloud of the live demo. So we're gonna go and see if we really did. <laughs> the proof of life moment. Here it comes. Yeah. So. Obviously relying on the DNS I set up previously. Almost. Here it comes. Voila. Then we see that that dashboard. Hey, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that is great. And that the was demo guys love it. So. And a good, this is terrific. A couple of things I, I you know, want to point out that have been done here. Um, a storage mm -hmm. class was created. And I didn't mention much about it, but the Cinder um, storage class is, is created for the um, by default out of um, uh, the IPI installer. Um, again, you, you can modify that, you can change that, you can do what you want, but uh, you get that one. That that one's built in, and so you're you're getting that that immediate integration with um, with OpenStack, where you can use it to uh, use it for. Um, for persistent volumes um, and it's, uh, uh, the other pieces. If we had, let's see, what else I did go on if, about if you, was if, our. If you had to, um, you know, if we, you did integrate with, with Manila, if you had a deployment mm. that had Manila, you would see an additional, um, that's where you would set up your, well, the, the Manila operator would automatically create an additional um, storage class for you. Yeah, that's, ah, oh, right, okay. So again, that, that installer is handling all that for you. Here's our autoscaler. Yeah. Might as well scale this while we're here. That install definitely was. Uh, oh, it's, now we can, you know, we've got the, the auto scale ready. There we go, ready to go. You can see it appear there shortly. And overall, I mean, that's I, I probably couldn't have asked for more with that installation and that timing um, to actually have been able to to go through all that. 
I don't know if I actually I had any more slides to. No, see, I prepared this slide. This is my just in case slide. Success, but it's a different one, obviously. <laughs> So um, that was just to sort of end it off. Just, just, that but was the just in case one. That was the just in case, yeah. Um, say, you know, look, I, I really can do this. It, it does actually work. But I don't need to do that because it really does actually work. And, um, you know, working within Red Hat with a lot of the upstream guys to and, and, and gals to, to put this, um, to see how this comes together, it's just getting better and better with each with each new cut. And, and the add features to it, like you wouldn't believe, but the integrations have become so clean. I mean, literally, um, even the UPI install, which used to really you know, terrify me, is perfectly documented. There's a bunch of uh, helper scripts to make it work. I know Nick loves to bash about on it and find all the various issues. Um, um, but it, it, it's you know it, it works right out of the box. It, you know these these two technologies just work so nicely together. So here we go. Uh, I've added those two uh, workers. Um, remember, we had an extra network, so that's not been forgotten. They've been plumbed into that, that network. I haven't had to do any kind of complicated setup on the host. I'm not pixie booting. I mean, it's all being taken care of. Um, it feels like I'm on public cloud. It, the integration between the two is is so is becoming so clean that I feel confident with my OpenStack cloud running Open uh, OKD, OpenShift, whatever. Um, because it's just built so nicely. I mean, I'm, I'm just clicking buttons here. And of course, you can do all this with the CLI, but that wouldn't be as fun to watch. Yeah. Or maybe it would be. Maybe. <laughs> kind of harder. Like harder to <laughs> yeah. Um, so what else can we add, Nick? I mean, this is there. The, the install is coming up. Um, now, this is just open. Oh, this is just OKD. There's nothing to, to show off about how these nodes are add, added to the cluster. Um, but it, as you can see with the screen here, um, it's all managed through those OpenStack APIs, meaning our OpenStack admins are aware of what's going on. They're able to control um, quotas, access to resources, ensure that tenants have what they need, uh, where, uh, and, and then the uh, tenant running OKD is able to do what they need to do. They're able to um, scale, um, um, uh, access externally, run multiple clusters. It pretty much gives you a public cloud-like experience, but on something so much cooler than public cloud uh, with OpenStack. And Nick, I don't know if you want to, I can't say much more. It's all happening. Well, I mean, uh, I can mention what I've been playing with, and that's, um, you know, if you had an OpenStack that had bare metal as a service as well, um, mm. with through the UPI, you, you can actually achieve um, a scenario where you've got OpenStack deploying bare metal workers for you as well, connected dynamically and connected straight into the um, uh, the OKD cluster without even you know just as you just as we've scaled up now for um, for virtualized workers, you can have bare metal machines deployed for you and attached directly into the OKD cluster. Pretty cool. I, I love how you say that um, the private cloud is the coolest out there, and um, I have to have to agree um, for <laughs> for lots of different reasons. But um, I think it is one of the one of the neatest things to see um, us to be able to do um, a full stack there with open all open source stuff. It's really pretty awesome. So um, I I'm really grateful you guys got up so early. So um, you're the only ones with light in the room um, so far today. We had people up at midnight um, in the EU and uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah. So I, I'm really I'm very grateful to be um, have you guys um, on and look forward to collaborating a lot more with the OpenStack community um, and and bringing this uh, bringing this to the forefront. I think you guys there's an Open Infra uh, Summit I think in October. That we're going to try and do an open stack commons with an open an open shift commons with an open stack theme. Um, yeah. It was the the event that was supposed to be in Berlin. So um, I'm negotiating, you know, how to co-locate virtually with the Open Stack Foundation. But hopefully, we'll get you guys back on stage, hopefully before October. But um, mm -hmm. to continue um, on the live stream, having a lot of open stack uh, content because um, I think there's a, there's a good number of our um, 
end users who are, are deploying OKD, OpenShift, and um, on OpenStack these days, and we, we'd love to, to hear from you all as, as much as possible. So um, kudos to you guys for, for getting up. Um, is there any last words or a slide or anything that you wanted to end on, um, just in case we want to get a hold of you? And a fair point. Uh, I didn't actually prepare that. Um, no, I, I, and the more we hear from people, the better. Um, so I, I'm easy. I'm August at redhat.com. Um, and um, I think you, sh I don't know if you shared a Twitter handle, at SilentOg on Twitter. Um, but yeah, just reach out, ask questions. There's a bunch of stuff out there that we've produced. Nick works on blogs. I've got some blogs on OpenShift. Um, we want to share the uh, shift and OKD on Stack experience because it is growing. And as you can see, in you know 36 minutes, we've got a container-enabled cloud. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty awesome. So um, I guess to end on, yeah, I just the more we talk, the better. And I just can't wait to hear more. I'm so excited to have been given the opportunity to actually do this. I was terrified, but I was super excited. So, <laughs> That's so what we'd like I'm, to I'm do. Yeah. We, we love to and scare the people. It's, uh, and the fact that it's all 100% open source really excites me. Yeah. There's no proprietary yeah. cloud there. There's no... There's nothing. Yeah. And yeah. and there's, you know, and, and if you go for the commercial versions as well, there's... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of companies already using this stuff out there. Yep, and as they say, it's it's open source turtles all the way down. So yep. uh, it's, it's really pretty cool.